I'm Dr. Richard O'Connor. I'm a retired physician uh, in the United States. I graduated from Baylor College of Medicine in 1980. And I did not work as a radiologist over the course of my career. Uh, most of it was spent as an anesthesiologist at St. Peter's Hospital in Helena, Montana. Uh, but over the course of my career, I looked at a lot of um, radiological studies, you know, plain film x-rays <clears throat> and CAT scans and MRI scans. So I've had quite a bit of exposure to these types of studies. Um, I do speak some Spanish, and this has allowed me to communicate with one of the primary investigators of the Nazca mummies, uh, Dr. Jose de la Cruz Rios Lopez, who uh, lives in Campeche, Mexico, um, and he's been directly involved in the study of the Nazca mummies. And so this has really helped me to understand that these discoveries down in Peru are very important to our understanding of um, what's been going on relative to what may very well be extraterrestrial visitation to our planet. Um, this is just a reminder that uh, the James Webb Space Telescope um, <clears throat> has taken this photo you see on the left there of our Milky Way galaxy and how many stars there are. Um, and there's now estimated to be about 100 billion planetary systems just in our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, and uh, within those planetary systems, um, there are statistical estimates made now that um, there may be as many as 30 actively communicating civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy. This number 21.6 sextillion planets in the observable universe is a number that none of us can really get our head around, but it just tells us that the number of planets out there is almost infinite. Um, so las momias de Nazca, that's how you say the, the mummies in Spanish. Um, this one you see on the left is been named Maria. All of the, um, the mummies that have been discovered in Peru have been given names to be able to refer to them in a meaningful way. And there are three points that I want to make about these mummies. The first point and the most important point is that these mummies are real. Uh, these have not been artificially assembled, and we can see this uh, when we look at the um, plain film x-rays and the CAT scans, both uh, conventional CAT scans and 3D CAT scans that have been done on several of these um, mummies. And by the way, these are not really mummies in the sense that we're, we usually use the term, because these, these uh, corpses have all of their internal organs still in place, although they're quite uh, desiccated and shriveled. Um, they're all still there. Um, I would, the second point I wanna make is that it's very probable, uh, I believe, that these species are tied to the modern day UFO and um, abduction phenomena. And I think it is also probable that these species are tied to the modern day crop circle and possibly the cattle mutilation phenomena. The, the white substance that you see covering Maria in the previous slide is diatomaceous earth. So I wanna be very clear about this point. These mummies are not made out of plaster, although it, it looks at first glance like they might be made out of plaster, they are not. They're covered in diatomaceous earth, which a, is a sedimentary rock that's um, easily refined into a white powder. And the, the main property of diatomaceous earth that made it useful uh, in preserving these mummies is that it is a very powerful desiccant. It has insecticidal properties, antibacterial and antifungal properties. 
and um, therefore it was used to preserve these mummies. And their state of preservation is actually quite remarkable. Uh, they're extremely well preserved. Um, this is what diatomaceous earth uh, in the, on the right hand side, you see the, the glass houses that these um, microscopic algae uh, create and live in. And when they die, these are what are left behind. And this is what forms diatomaceous earth. On the left, you can see living diatoms and how beautiful and varied their color and their uh, structures are. <clears throat> so this is some important background information about the Nazca mummies. Um, they were discovered by a man who we first knew as Mario, but later learned his name is Leandro Rivera. He discovered the, the Nazca mummies in a cave in Peru in 2015. And um, the cave is allegedly very near to the site where the Nazca lines, uh, which are only appreciated from the air. Uh, and this is all near the area of Palpa, Peru. Um, the, Mexico's uh, TV personality, Jaime Mausan, has reported that there may be as many as 100 to 150 similar corpses or body parts, which are severed heads and severed hands that are also preserved in this diatomaceous earth in this uh, cave near Palpa, Peru. Um, Ten of these Nazca mummies have been recovered and submitted for scientific analysis by the Incari Institute in Cusco. And all 10 of those Nazca mummies have been given names. The three new species have been proposed, uh, humanoid reptiles, humanoid insectoids, and one humanoid hybrid named Maria, which they've given the species label Hamin palapensis. Um, <clears throat> several of these mummies have been studied using uh, plain film x-rays, uh, 2D and 3T CAT scans, carbon-14 dating, and also DNA analysis. <clears throat> According to the uh, Peruvian journalist, Joís Mantilla, the Nazca mummies are now being studied in Peru, Brazil, Japan, Russia, Spain, and recently by a team that went down to Peru from the United States. So, you know, before we get into the videos of the Nazca mummies, I just wanted to show people what modern day uh, ORIF means, open reduction, internal fixation. Uh, surgical techniques are involved in either uh, fusing joints or, um, or fixing fractures of bones. Uh, these are what the x-rays look like of those types of surgical uh, interventions. Um, what you see here uh, on the left is a finger that's been repaired with a, a Kirshner wire or what we call a K wire um, sent up in the uh, medullary part of the bone and then fixed with a stainless wire. Um, on the right here, we see an open reduction internal fixation of an ankle fracture you can see that the end of the fibula there is quite fractured <clears throat> and it's been repaired with a plate and a <clears throat> screws and then a long screw uh, between the fibula and the tibia to um, reapproximate the ankle, what's called the ankle mortise or the joint there. <clears throat> so this is what we would be looking for in these uh, radiological studies of the mummies uh, if they had been put together artificially, uh, we would expect to see some sort of fixation technique similar to what's used today in modern orthopedic surgery. Um, these x-rays are um, an arthrodesis or a, a fusion of a joint. On the left here, you can see the long screw is a fusion of the uh, navicular bone in the ankle to the calcaneus. 
um, and other smaller screws used to accomplish this uh, arthrodesis or this fusion of the ankle. Um, probably this person was in chronic pain and um, they decided to go ahead and fuse these bones to reduce that, that patient's pain. On the right here, we can see um, a plate and screw fusion or arthrodesis of the wrist joint in an individual with probably with severe rheumatoid arthritis. Now understand that all of these surgical repairs require a skin incision and um, they have to obviously have access to the underlying bone. So that happens through a skin incision. Thus, they call it an open reduction. So um, compute, computed tomography um, is a blending of radiology and computer science. And uh, so th these were first referred to as EMI scans. Uh, EMI being a company in Great Britain, Electric and Music Industries, which was also the recording center for the Beatles when they first began recording their music back in the 1960s. Because the Beatles were so successful and they were bringing in uh, so much money to EMI for record the recordings of their music, um, that made available funding to do research uh, on the development of CT scans. So the first CT scan was done by this inventor, Godfrey Hounsfield, and a physicist named Dr. Alan McCormick uh, there in London at the Atkinson Morley Hospital in 1971. And CAT scanners became a commercially available in 1972. So these two individuals, uh, Godfrey Hounsfield and Dr. <coughs> Cormac <coughs> were um, awarded a Nobel Prize in 1979 for their work in developing the uh, CT scan scanners. Um, the CT scan has become an essential tool in modern medicine, and now over 80 million CAT scans are done in the United States every year. So, you know, ironically, we can thank the Beatles in a sort of a roundabout way for having uh, produced their music that produced the funding to do the research that was involved in creating our modern day CAT scanners. So thank you, uh, Beatles, for your work on this. Um, I want to show you also the effect that metal has on CAT scanners. Uh, metal in a person's body causes a lot of scattering of the x-rays and results in a lot of artifact that is seen in <clears throat> four out of these five images that you see. On the upper left is a normal CAT scan image without any metal. And then the other four images you see here are all being affected by the metal in, these pa in this patient's um, hip replacements. So the ball joint in the hip is causing a lot of distortion in the um, radio signals or X-ray signals and um, creating these artifacts that make uh, any reading of the soft tissues uh, pretty much impossible. So <clears throat> now that you've seen what um, surgical interventions look like, uh, hardware that's used to fix joints and fractured bones and such, and the effects of metal in a body on a CT scan. Um, we're going to move on now to the um, the Nazca mummies and some of the radiological studies that have been done on those. Um, this is the the website um, for the Incari Institute there in Cusco, Peru, and um, <clears throat> although. It doesn't look like I can take you there and show you the website. I recommend that you go there and you um, look through a lot of the information under the heading discoveries and you'll you'll see a, a drop down menu of a lot of different uh, studies that have been done on different Nazca mummies. And um, 
you know, most importantly, I would say uh, take a look at some of the uh, CAT scans uh, that you'll find there. Um, make note of the carbon-14 dating that's been done on Maria uh, that has yielded a result of around 1,750 years. And um, the DNA analysis on Maria which shows that uh, I believe it's about a third of her DNA is human DNA and the remainder of her DNA is unclassified. Um, so what that tells us is that um, this unclassified DNA uh, is not a surprise because, you know, we haven't been able to catalog all the DNA of different species on Earth. But it's very significant that she has human DNA. And certainly in her appearance, uh, her anatomical or morphological appearance uh, it appears to be very humanoid. So uh, please spend some time uh, at that website and um, take a look at the evidence that they have put forward for us, fortunately. Um, the Earth Biogenome Project is a, a huge project that's being undertaken to catalog all of the species on Earth. But um, as you can imagine, this is a gigantic undertaking and uh, they've just, you know, kind of barely gotten started on it. But it is very significant that they, you know, we've had the human genome sequenced for quite some time now. And we know what human DNA looks like. And um, so that's how they were able to determine that uh, this Nazca mummy named Maria definitely has uh, human DNA. Um, <clears throat> there's another Nazca mummy that they've called Josephina. And, um, <clears throat> you know, this is a plain film X-ray of Josephina, which as you can see, appears quite human in many respects, you know, head, thorax, abdomen, arms, legs, feet, hands, etc. Uh, but the x-ray also shows us that she's quite different than a human in that um, she doesn't have the typical ball and socket joints in the shoulders or in the um, hips that we would see in a human. The ribs are horizontal. Um, and uh, have kind of a strange appearance. Um, <clears throat> and down in the pelvis of Josefina, we see these three radio opaque objects that have since been determined to be eggs in this uh, rather reptilian um, species. We also see here that Josefina has this uh, sort of dumbbell shaped metallic radio opaque object uh, affixed to her anterior chest wall. And um, this object is, has been determined to be about 85% copper um, with some silver, but also um, according to one report, osmium was part of the metallic makeup of this object. Well, osmium is the rarest element in Earth's crust. In order to get 30 grams of osmium, uh, 22 million tons, sorry, 22 million pounds of platinum ore has to be processed in order to come up with a yield of 30 grams of osmium. So it's quite rare, quite difficult to come by. And um, when this object on Josefina's chest wall was um, sort of biopsied, uh, or they took a sample of the metal uh, to have it analyzed, what they discovered was that it was adherent to the underlying tissues of Josefina. It had sort of intercalated itself into the underlying uh, skin, muscle, and even bone of Josefina. So this is a completely unknown to modern science how this would be accomplished. 
Um, the other thing to take note of here is the area there uh, at the shoulders, the, the bone that you see going across the width of the chest, just under the neck, that in humans we would call those clavicles, but in these um, humanoid reptiles like Josefina, uh, this would be referred to as a furcula, uh, which we see in modern avian species uh, and sometimes it's, it's referred to as a wishbone. So um, although similar to humans, also much different. Um, this is a video of a CAT scan that was done on one of the Nazca mummies called Montserrat. And Montserrat, uh, it was discovered um, at the time this CAT scan was taken that this, uh, this being was pregnant at the time that she died. And so let me run this video for you. Todos esos verdes que Todos se ven. Todos esos verdes son sí. metálicos. Metálicos, como cuerpo extraño. A ver si parece que hubieran restos de, de... Hay huesitos pequeñitos, mira. ¿Cómo? Hay huesitos pequeñitos como si estuviera embarazada. ¿En el abdomen? Sí, mira, ahí están. Fragmentos de hueso. Sí, pequeño. Esto le tiene que ser como un feto pequeño. Ya, fragmentos de hueso. Sí, sí. Sí, sí. Mira, esto es un huesito. Ya. Esto puede ser su columna. Y ahí le tiene que ser un poco más de ahí. Y un detalle. Como lo que significa tener el lado de este con una gestación. Esta es su cabecita, parece su ojo. Ya está. Este es, este es la, 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 el fragmento y esta es la columna. Sí, esta es su cabecita. Esto parece en su agujero de los ojos. Esto es un video cervical de acá. Esas son sus extremidades. Ya está. Y es, no, no hay duda. Hay extremidad en cabeza y no hay duda, pues. Sí, estaba... Es these corpses. The other thing that's very significant is that the researchers have found no um, evidence of any skin incisions or interruptions in the integument of any of these creatures that would have uh, resulted from an artificial assembly of bones covered by a skin or, you know, inserting bones through, a, through an incision in the skin. Uh, that just wasn't found. Um, this is a, a comparison of a human on the left. We see a human foot um, and ankle. And then on the right, uh, the ankle detail of this Nazca mummy called Montserrat. So you see there on the right, uh, the three, what we would call metatarsals. Uh, and then the, um, the tarsal bones uh, that, that are numbered there, one, two, three, four, on the right um, are analogous to human tarsal bones. Uh, number one would be an analog of the human cuboid. Number four would be an analog of the human navicular bone. Uh, but numbers two and three would uh, be the analogs of hu the human cuneiform uh, tarsal bones. But in humans, we have three cuneiform bones in our um, tarsal bones, and, and here we see that uh, Montserrat just demonstrates two tarsal bones. Um, again, you know, make a note that you what you see here are the articular surfaces of these bones are so perfectly aligned and matched, uh, and even you can see the joint capsules are intact. Um, 
so you know there's no way that this is an artificially assembled uh, foot and ankle uh, this is all natural all very real um, these are some geoglyphs that are found in the Atacama Desert and I, I wanted to show this one on the on the right um, is a geoglyph that I believe is found in northern Chile but you can see that um, in the blue uh, is highlighted the hand of this geoglyph of this uh, being that's depicted in this geoglyph and um, it's very clearly uh, and uh, deliberately um, put there with three a hand with three digits and then if we look at the um, this right leg of this geoglyph you see there this peculiar um, right angle of the uh, distal part of the foot and um, that also appears to be a very deliberate depiction of how these beings actually look um, if we look at the next slide uh, the foot detail of one of these beings there in the middle um, CAT scan of the of the foot um, that you see right in the center there uh, that angulation um, about a 90 degree angle between the distal phalanx of that um, of that digit um, also above there you can see how the Achilles tendon which we have humans have as well our Achilles tendon inserts on our calcaneus on the posterior surface of our calcaneus here you see the Achilles tendon but it inserts on the bone above <coughs> uh, what would in humans would be the talus uh, but in this uh, being the Achilles tendon inserts on the bone above the the heel bone um, and then over on the right there's sort of a detailed drawing of what these the distal or part of the the foot looks like in these beings um, cojinetes the word there cojinetes means um, the bearing surface of the uh, of the digit um, and it says huellas dactylares which huellas are are fingerprints and in the next slide you can see that maria demonstrates these you know they're slightly arced but mostly horizontal fingerprints uh, as opposed to on the right here is shown a human fingerprint uh, that's more radially uh, or circularly arranged uh, so similar to humans but different um, so a team from the United States went down to Peru recently within the past couple of weeks uh, today when I'm recording this it's uh, April the the uh, 19th and I think they were down there like yeah maybe two weeks ago uh, this is a a team of people who um, are great people to go down there and take a look at this uh, Dr. Caruso, James Caruso, um, was the medical examiner for Denver, and he is a forensic pathologist. Um, Dr. William Rodriguez is a forensic anthropologist um, who worked at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. And Dr. John McDowell is a forensic odontologist uh, who was a professor emeritus at the University of Colorado. So these three men went down there to Peru to take a look at uh, the mummies and the evidence that's been put together so far. Um, they have not yet rendered an opinion uh, based on what they saw, but they, they did say that the Peruvian uh, researchers were very accommodating, made all of their uh, research data available and um, Dr. McDowell came back uh, saying that this is a very important investigation worthy of further study. Um, you know, this slide, I would just say, 
you, you may have heard of this man, David Grush, who is a, uh, he was an intelligence officer for the United States who worked with the uh, geospatial, uh, what they call the, the National Geospatial Intelligence Center. Uh, I think he worked a little bit with the National Reconnaissance Office, uh, which, you know, does satellite um, reconnaissance work for the government. And um, also he had some connections with the UAP task force. Um, and on July the 26th, he went before Congress and testified under oath that he was certain that the United States government had recovered um, alien or extraterrestrial UFOs and what he called biologics or bodies or body parts of extraterrestrial or let's say non-human intelligence uh, beings. Um, so he made these claims under oath in front of Congress. And, uh, you know, I certainly believe what he said is true. Um, and I just, you know, thought it was remarkable that when we look at the appearance of these uh, humanoid reptile Nazca mummies, um, like Josefina, which is shown here in the um, photograph on the left, and then we look at Steven Spielberg's E.T. Uh, that was seen by you know millions of people, has been uh, over the years, that was first produced in 1982. Um, I find it just remarkable, the similarity between uh, this species of Nazca mummies and the uh, appearance of the being that Spielberg featured in his film. And I wonder, you know, is Spielberg psychic or did he have some inside information about what these beings actually looked like that may have been known to some, you know, people with more knowledge than I uh, back in 1982? Uh, so I don't know, but, you know, decide for yourself. I think the similarities are just striking. Um Cultural references to three-fingered beings are, are found around our planet. Um, these are some textiles that um, are from Peru. You can see here that these beings are depicted with three fingers and three toes uh, in both of these examples. Um, I unfortunately don't have any information about the age of these um, examples, but um, certainly the one on the right looks like it's worn through in one place and looks like it might be quite old. Um, the pottery that you see here on the left uh, has a date on it from between 1300 to 200 AC. So this is in Peru. AC means antes de Cristo. So uh, uh, we would say BC. Um, so this this pottery is about 3,000 years old. It very clearly shows a being with three fingers and three toes. Uh, so perhaps these beings have been uh, in contact with the indigenous people of Peru even 3,000 years ago. And then this petroglyph that you see on the right uh, was discovered on a rock very close to where the cave entrance was, uh, where these Nazca mummies were found. And the artist of that petroglyph obviously made a, an effort to very clearly uh, point out that uh, it was referencing a being with three fingers. Um, in New Zealand, we see uh, in the Maori culture, uh, these carvings are all over the place in New Zealand. Um, these pictures were taken uh, near Rotorua, New Zealand. And uh, in both of the pictures, you can see that these beings were carved with, a, with uh, three fingers. Um, I spoke actually with one of the master carvers of the Maori people uh, and um, asked him if he was aware that these three-fingered beings 
had been discovered in Peru. And he told me that, yes, he was aware of it and that uh, the Maori people postulated that there was a connection between their god that they, they carve uh, so frequently and um, what's been discovered in Peru. So even here in the United States, um, we see depictions of these three fingered beings. I took this photograph uh, last October 2023 at a, a Native American trading post in Maine. Um, and it very clearly shows a being there with three fingers and three toes. And then in Utah, there is a place called Three Fingers Canyon that has a petroglyph that very obviously shows three fingers and three toes. Also, uh, this patch from the US Department of Defense uh, seems to be a real thing. And in that patch, you can see this very alien looking creature with three fingers. And um, this Sigma signal uh, references the the zero sigma uh, radar signature of the B-2 stealth bomber that the little alien there has his three fingers on either side of. This patch was created for the 509th bomb group, which was the, the bomb group that uh, Jesse Marcel Sr., the man who first went out to find the crash material from a UFO that crashed outside of Roswell in July of 1947. Uh, he, he picked up that debris and brought it home and showed it to his son and his wife. And just as an aside, his son, Dr. Jesse Marcel Jr., worked in Helena, Montana at St. Peter's Hospital with me. Um, and uh, I worked with Dr. Marcel there for uh, probably 11 or 12 years before he went out to the VA. Um, I knew Dr. Marcel quite well as a friend and as a medical colleague. And um, he and I had several conversations over the years about Roswell and his involvement in holding in his hands and closely inspecting the debris that his father brought home from that crash that that his father told him was um, not of this world, was not from Earth, but was in fact the debris from a flying saucer. <clears throat> uh, because I know Dr. or I knew Dr. Marcel so well, I will vouch for his integrity and his honesty. And I'm 100 percent certain that that's exactly what happened. Um, this is just kind of an aside. Uh, this is a patch that the Roswell police force is now putting on their uniforms and it says protect and serve those that land here, uh, referencing the, the UFO crash at Roswell. And in the middle of the R there, you can see the, the little UFO with the beam coming down. And, uh, I think it's a, a really cool patch. This picture I took in Germany, I believe this was in Cologne, Germany, um, and it it shows that th this meme of the alien reality is slowly insinuating itself into um, our global reality. <laughs> so there needs to be a lot more research done on the Nazca mummies. There's much more to do, but they are definitely worth studying. Um, for one thing, burials like this, where these corpses were buried in diatomaceous earth to preserve them, is not common in Peru. This is not typically how the indigenous people there buried their dead. These are very, very unusual. And we have to ask, you know, did the indigenous people of Peru know that diatomaceous earth was a desiccant? that had these properties of uh, antibacterial, antifungal, and insecticidal properties. I suspect that they didn't know that, that they were uh, either instructed to bury these, these beings and these body parts in diatomaceous earth, or other 
otherwise these beings themselves did this to you know to preserve their dead uh, I don't know um, who buried these beings whether it was the indigenous Peruvians themselves or the non-human intelligence uh, as I'll refer to them these Nazca mummies I don't know how available diatomaceous earth is in the Palpa region of Peru. You know, diatomaceous earth is not a rare mineral. It's certainly uh, commonly found around the world, but you know, if it had to be, to be transported to this area to, specifically for this purpose, uh, I would like to know that. And so that could be another uh, focus of the research is where did this diatomaceous earth come from? Um, if the if it was the non-human intelligence of of these Nazca mummies themselves who buried these bodies why did they do that was this their own cultural practice did they mean to come back and retrieve them later or was it something else that we can talk about at a later slide we also would love to know what is the percentage of osmium in Josefina's metal implant, you know, that dumbbell shaped implant that had grown into the tissues of her anterior chest wall. Um, what, what was the osmium content in that? How many grams of osmium are actually in that implant? If it's, you know, a number of grams, that's very significant considering that uh, we have to, to process 22 million pounds of platinum ore to get 30 grams of osmium. So this video showed up on YouTube about 12 years ago, and it's a very significant video in my opinion. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the video here. I don't know if the sound is going to come through, but these two men are speaking in Russian. Вот вот там нашли, короче, ну, смотри. Пойдём в Ну вон, вон у него, видишь. Сейчас сюда проходим, смотри. So as the camera starts to zoom in here, you can see this little creature that's down on the lower right. And it's sort of partially buried in snow. But I would guess it looks to be somewhere between two feet long. It's obviously been in a, a severe accident of some kind. Um, it's lost part of its left leg and almost all of its right leg. Uh, all of it, almost all of its left arm is missing. Unfortunately, we don't get a good look at the hands of this being to see how many fingers there are on this being. Of course, you know, NBC, Fox, the Daily Mail, World Weekly News, Live Science, uh, this was kind of widely covered in the media, but all of them, as they always do, uh, wrote this video off as a hoax. Um, it doesn't look like a hoax to me. I cannot prove that it's not a hoax, but you know, it looks quite real to me and very organic, very natural, although quite severely injured. And uh, so if anybody speaks Russian, it would be interesting to know what these two men say to each other as the one with the camera is approaching and filming this being. So, you know, if this video is real, and if we look at this side-by-side -side comparison of these two creatures, the similarity between them is just unmistakable and remarkable. You know, they're basically of similar size. Their anatomy looks quite similar. The upper thorax or, or chest looks very similar. 
Um, you know, and this this looks like the same species of being to me. Uh, obviously, the one on the right's been preserved in diatomaceous earth for over a thousand years, so you know it doesn't look quite the same, but wow, very similar. Um, <clears throat> the other point that I'd like to make is if this being shown in the film is real, and these are the same species, then this is in my in my view this is a, a solid proof that uh, these are not demons or angels or other descriptors like you know this that we oftentimes see online um, these were real flesh and blood creatures that um, if this video is real we know still exist and are still around earth today um, <clears throat> the remarkable thing is that we have to realize is that if the Nazca mummies are real, which they are, there's no doubt in my mind that they're real, then their evolutionary predecessors or their ancestors have not been found in Earth's fossil record. And therefore, we know that they did not naturally evolve on Earth. Um, and they're still here if this video is real. So either the Nazca mummies came to Earth from some other planet at least 1,750 years ago, or they were genetically engineered here by some other race of non-human intelligent beings. Okay, There's, that's, that's all it can be. Um, so they are obviously a product of genetic hybridization with humans. And um, the humanoid reptile, like Josefina, also exhibits anatomical similarity, similarities to a class of dinosaurs that we refer to as theropods, which gradually evolved into avian species like uh, for example, the ostrich. Um, so, you know, it kind of raises a chicken or egg question as to who was here first. You know, are they are they the genetically engineered beings or are we the genetically engineered beings? Um, this passage in Genesis, uh, in the Bible, in Genesis, has always intrigued me because it says what it says and that is it says let us make mankind in our image in our likeness so that sounds like there were a group of people working on a genetic engineering project to create the species homo sapiens uh, our species so you know which came first well, I don't, I can't answer that question. I don't think we have the, the data to answer that question yet. But certainly studying the Nazca mummies is going to be very helpful. Uh, there's no telling how much information can be gleaned from these, uh, these corpses by researchers who know what they're doing, who have the proper tools to do, uh, to gather the data that is needed. Um, Interestingly, in the in the New York Times just a few days ago, I saw this article: "Should we change species to save them?" Uh, so you know, we humans are thinking about pondering the possibility and the need for actually um, changing the the genome of species in order to make them more resilient and less prone to extinction. So if we're thinking about doing this, then a, another species of very advanced and highly intelligent beings probably has already done it. 
Um, so whoever created these Nazca mummies are masters in genetic engineering. And they've been, a, they've been here for at least 1,750 years. If we look at that piece of pottery that we saw earlier, that was about 3,000 years ago. Um, so they've been aware of humans and planet Earth for this length of time. And I don't know about you, but I've been living my life uh, as far as the these beings are concerned, uh, really without any any real evidence that they even exist. I mean, certainly uh, it's been peaceful, uh, a peaceful coexistence as far as uh, the vast majority of us are concerned. So I think that we can be pretty confident that they did not come here and they are not here to harm us. Um, that would be my uh, first take on this. And unless proven otherwise, that would be my operative um, presumption is that they are here to peacefully coexist um, with humanity and really haven't stirred up hardly any trouble uh, in my life. Um, these, these two pictures show the uh, <clears throat> the CEO of uh, Inkari Institute, uh, Mr. Um, Hameen, and he's examining a, a stone artifact that was taken out of one of, uh, out of this cave where these beings were discovered. I should say allegedly taken out of uh, the cave. I don't know that for certain, but that's what, um, that's what I'm led to believe. So, <clears throat> you know, with just a little bit of imagination, you might you might say, well, whoever carved that carved it to look like a UFO. And as he turns it over and examines the bottom, you can see that it has these three little appendages on it. Um, and when I looked at those, those remind me very much of the three appendages that Bob Lazar described in the um, you can see in the drawing that he's doing here in the upper right hand corner of the drawing, the circle with the three, what he called gravity amplifiers or gravity translators uh, that he worked on at this area S4 uh, on, on area 51. And then on the right, you can see a photograph that was taken by George Adamski back in the 50s, in the 1950s, shows these three appendages on the bottom of this UFO. And, uh, you know, when I, when I looked at that stone carving, it just makes me think of, of these images of Bob Lazar and, and George Adamski's. Um, <clears throat> I want to play for you a short video. I, I did this recording with this lady named Carol at the Jesse A. Marcel Library. Uh, this was about 10 years ago, I would say, that we did this recording. And Carol had a very significant experience uh, while she was living in Santa Cruz. So hopefully the sound comes through here for you. Um, it's just a short video. Uh, my husband and I were in bed. Um, I don't know what time of night it was, but we were sound asleep. I was sound asleep. And I woke up. I don't know what woke me up, but uh, I looked at the window and there was something outside the window. Uh, it was bright and illuminated, and the um, curtains were drawn. However, the inside of the curtain was flipped up as like it was levitated from outside. And this being had its finger pointed in the window at the curtain or at me. I'm not sure. 
um, it was flesh colored, I would say, light colored, illuminated as I said, and it had what we know now to be a common uh, depiction of an extraterrestrial with the big eyes and the oval face, more big at the top, smaller at the bottom. And uh, the one thing that was really prominent to me was uh, the finger was elongated and real bony like. And, um, well, I was paralyzed, absolutely paralyzed. So, um, Carol gives a very, I think, good description of what she saw there that that night. <clears throat> and her story, you know, is not unique. There's many, many, many stories of people that have uh, alleged that they were abducted by aliens. Um, Betty and Barney Hill would be one of the first uh, examples of this. But interestingly, and, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but there's been a lot of uh, very, I would say, prominent people that have claimed alien abduction. Uh, one man, Kirsan, Ilyumzinov, uh, who was the president of Kalmykia, which is uh, within Russia, um, he stated that he was taken out of his apartment and into a UFO and was actually taken out into space. Um, a similar story, uh, Miyuki Hatoyama, who was the first lady of Japan married to the president or the prime minister of Japan, um, was she said that she was taken by in a UFO to the planet Venus. And um, then, of course, there's the story of Travis Walton, who was abducted near uh, Snowflake, Air, uh, Arizona, uh, back in the 70s. So uh, there's really probably hundreds of these types of stories that have come from people who have been courageous enough to come forward and, and talk about what happened to them. Um, Carol told me that this memory of what happened to her stays with her every day. She's never forgotten it and never will. This is, you know, just to reinforce what Carol said, that the finger was elongated and real bony like. Well, that's a, a very apt description of what we see here in these photographs of these Nazca mummy. <clears throat> this is Maria's hand on the left and one of the severed hands that was found in the cave on the right. Um, this slide is, maybe it's not, it doesn't really even belong in this presentation, but uh, just out of interest that UFOs, and, and that's what I call them, I call them UFOs. I don't call them UAP as we've been trying. They've been trying to train us to use the term UAP which in my view is just sort of a confusing term. Uh, when we talk about UFOs, we know we all know what we're talking about. We're talking about an extraterrestrial craft that exhibits these five observables that were described by uh, Luis Elizondo. And uh, we all know when we say UFOs what we're talking about. So I'm using UFOs. So <clears throat> recently we've had reports of UFOs actually swarming over Langley Air Force Base and uh, putting pressure, I think, on the military, on the U.S. Department of Defense to disclose what they know about this non-human intelligence behind the UFO phenomenon, which is also quite real. Um, <clears throat> So why are they why are they here this non-human intelligence? Well, we don't really know, but obviously they've been here for a long time. If they're not here to conquer us, then it's possible that that human beings and earth and the biome of earth may be their pet project. 
Um, or they may be trying to genetically meld with our species in order to uh, coexist and co-inhabit Earth. Uh, this is the, the analysis of Dr. David Jacobs, who has done a lot of work interviewing abductees, and that's his conclusion. Um, he considers this to be a, a nefarious uh, program. Um, I don't necessarily see it that way. You know, if they are trying to, to meld with Homo sapiens genetically and co-inhabit Earth, <coughs> then that may not be such a bad thing. It may produce a more fit species in the end that's better able to survive. Because uh, on our own, if we look around the world at what's going on today, we don't seem to be doing very well with uh, ourselves. And I would say that the, the the likelihood of our own extinction at the present time, I would say, is pretty high. So if we can do something to help improve the chances that the life of an intelligent species will continue, um, then maybe we should be supporting this instead of uh, condemning it. Um, they, they do try seem to be trying to help us in other ways by, for example, shutting down our nuclear weapons. Um, in my view, that's a great thing to do. We shouldn't have nuclear weapons. We should have zero nuclear weapons on this planet because they are such a menace, not only to our own civilization, but to all of the life on Earth. And uh, so I, I appreciate their efforts at shutting down our nuclear weapons. Um, they've also sent us some of the crop circles, in my opinion, and I want to show you this one crop circle that appeared at, at a place called the Crabwood Farm in the United Kingdom on August the 15th of 2002. It shows this image of an alien holding a disc. And if you look carefully at the bottom of the disc, you can see that the alien is holding the disc with three fingers. And if you look on the aliens or near the aliens right shoulder just above it actually i guess um, you see these three dots or yeah and i don't know what those mean but this may reference that these are that they're this is the three-fingered species that we're now seeing evidence of in the corpses of the nazca mummies the mummy that you see here on the right has been named sebastian and if this guy on the left came up and said, hey, I want you to meet my brother, Sebastian, I would say, wow, you two guys look a lot alike. You do look like brothers for sure. Um, so this disc that you see this alien on the left holding is a, a disc that is encoded in, bi in binary code. And the code was originally deciphered by a computer uh, scientist named Paul Viguet, uh, who also lived in the UK. And being a computer scientist, when he looked at this disk, he, he just immediately recognized, oh, that looks like binary code. And so he started to decipher it. And he determined that there was a message in this disk. And um, the entire message says, uh, Beware the bearers of false gifts and their broken promises. Much pain, but still time. Believe there is good out there. We oppose deception. So the, that phrase, uh, much pain, but still time. What is meant by that? Still time. That implies that at some point we're going to run out of time. And so we need to be giving very serious thought to what, what, is, what is it that limits our time? What is it that, that we need to do? What do we need to act on to avert some kind of apparent tragedy uh, that re is referenced in this disc? But I don't think you can escape the, the, 
you know, admitting that the similarity between the Nazca mummy labeled Sebastian here on the right and the Nazca mummy that we see in the crabwood crop circle are almost identical. Um, so the thing that's really very significant about the Nazca mummies is that all of this research and data and photographs and CAT scans has all been done. It's all out there in the public domain and therefore this stuff cannot be classified. It cannot be covered up <coughs> as has been done with over the past 80 years with a lot of the evidence concerning UFOs. Um, so as a result of this, we're going to start seeing a lot of pushback about the provenance of these mummies, about the, the studies that have been done on them, about the quality of the individuals, the researchers who have been working on this. And this is just one example, uh, Snopes.com, which is a service that many people go to to determine whether a story is, is true or not. They do fact checking of things. Allegedly, they do fact checking of things. And so Snopes asks, did researchers find a mummified three fingered alien in Nazca, Peru? Snopes says false. They did not find that. And they go on to say, but we are willing to say with certainty that it will not succeed where thousands of previous quote discoveries unquote have failed and present definitive scientifically verifiable proof of alien life. Well, that's just not true. It's already been done and it's going to be corroborated further by researchers that are now starting to embrace these mummies and are doing research on this in other countries besides Peru. And if these corpses are not alien in the sense that we use the word alien, then I don't know what would be. So, you know, we need to ask the question, why did they leave these corpses preserved in this diatomaceous earth for us to find it this time in our in the development of our civilization? Were these left there as a time capsule for us to discover at a particular time when our technological development has has progressed to a point where we now have these CAT scanners and MRI scanners and we're able to sequence DNA and we're able to carbon date things. In other words, we have the tools and the knowledge available to actually realize what we're looking at. Um, I think that's very possible. And in fact, I would say I think it is probable that that's why this was done. Um, there's a lot we're going to learn from the study of these very interesting corpses. <clears throat> um, there's been an effort by the Peruvian Ministry of Culture to confiscate these uh, Nazca mummies. Uh, that's happened at least twice that I know of. And I just have to send out an appeal to the Peruvian Ministry of Culture that please, please, this is very important research that's being done. And don't stand in the way of people that go down there that are qualified to do this research. Uh, let them do the research, let them investigate this and go as far with this research as they possibly can. Um, <clears throat> there have been suggestions made that these uh, that these specimens be shipped to different research centers around the world. Um, my opinion is that these these uh, are organic beings or specimens. Uh, they're fragile. They uh, can rot because they are organic. They require the dry climate found in the southern part of Peru to rem remain preserved and intact for future research. And these uh, specimens are extremely valuable. So um, I, would, I would encourage uh, conversations about possibly opening up an international research center down in or near Ica, Peru, uh, that would um, be connected with the uh, San Luis Gonzaga University there in Ica. 
And if this was built, I think researchers from all over the world would go down there and utilize uh, those facilities to, to further our knowledge about these Nazca mummies. Um, what we are seeing here is UFO disclosure by the people. And I would like to extend my thanks to um, Mario or Leandro Rivera, who went to jail uh, briefly. He was sentenced to four years in prison that was suspended and he was fined 68,000 soles, which is about 18,000 US dollars to bring these discoveries to the attention of Thierry Hamin, the Ankari Institute, and now the rest of the world. So um, although Waqueros in Peru are, are probably justifiably looked down on and, and treated pretty harshly, uh, in this case, I think uh, there's this, this is an exception. And Leandro Rivera, I commend him for recognizing the importance of these specimens and getting them into the hands of people who could begin to do the research to find out, you know, who and what they are. I'd like to thank Joiz Mantilla uh, and others who have stood up in front of the Peruvian Ministry of Culture when they have shown up and tried to confiscate these specimens uh, while also proclaiming them as fake, which they are not. Uh, thank you to Joiz Mantilla and others. Um, Jaime Maussan, uh, and Gaia.com from the United States uh, have kept pushing for the truth. Uh, Mr. Mausan has uh, stated that he's invested over 1 million US dollars to finance the research of these Nazca mummies. And I am extremely grateful to Mr. Mausan for the work he's done to move this forward. I'm grateful to the Peruvian and the Mexican scientists and medical professionals who have put their reputations on the line to render their informed opinions about these findings. And um, I know one of the forensic specialists, Dr. Jose Salce Benitez, lost his job with the Mexican military uh, for being engaged in this research. And uh, he continues, you know, he pushes forward. So thank you, Dr. Benitez. Also, thank you, Dr. Jose de la Cruz Rios Lopez for the work that you've done on and the time that you've taken to communicate with me about the findings. And um, there's been nearly 1000 people, mostly from France, who have donated through a crown crowdfunding um, effort to to get this research done. So I'm grateful to all of them. And they're any any unsung heroes that I'm not aware of who have moved this forward, um, thank you so much for your efforts, uh, which have been very important. Um, <clears throat> this is my license plate, and uh, I just was showing it here to lobby uh, once again that our world needs to get rid of nuclear weapons. The uh, non-human intelligence <clears throat> here with us that has shut down U.S. and Russian nuclear weapons. They're giving us an important message and we should be heeding it. Um, I just want to end this with this sober reminder that there's some new research based on data produ produced by the James Webb Space Telescope that this universe may be as much as 26.7 billion years old which is almost twice as old as we previously thought it was. Um, Homo sapiens, our species, has been around for maybe around 350,000 years. If this new data and this new number of 26.7 billion years of age of the universe is true, then our species has been around for 0.00112% of the age of the universe. <clears throat> In other words, we just got here. We just arrived at this party. We're trying to figure out what's going on, who we are, how we got here, uh, what all of this means. Uh, but I put a lot of hope and a lot of faith 
in that message I showed you earlier where it said, there is good out there. They oppose deception. Well, I oppose deception. I'm sure you oppose deception. And we've got to stop this cover up of the UFO reality, of the reality of the extraterrestrial presence on our planet. Uh, we just, it just has to stop. And we've got to get good data to help us move forward and find out the answers to all of our questions about uh, where this universe is headed, how we got here, and where we're going. So thank you very much for going with me through these slides. I hope that you'll um, support any further research on the Nazca mummies, and we can learn as much as we possibly can from these specimens that are very real and very important to our future. Thank you.